I'm just going to look at my notes because there's so much to talk about Habin. I could, uh, I could probably go on for the rest of this evening. Habin is an internationally acclaimed accessibility leader. She has earned recognition as a White House champion of change, Forbes 30 Under 30 leader, and BBC Women of Africa hero. Habin is the first deafblind person to graduate from the Harvard Law School, and she champions equal access. equal access to information for people with disabilities. She has been honored by US President Bill Clinton, President Barack Obama, and I truly hope the next US President also learns a few things from her. She doesn't like to be called inspiring, so I won't use that word. Haben offers accessibility and diversity training, consulting, and professional speaking services. She recently spoke to over 4,000 developers at Apple about the connection between disability and innovation. Habin grew up in San Francisco, Bay Area, where she currently lives with Maxine, her dog. And in addition to her accessibility work, she actually leads an incredibly rich life. She enjoys surfing and traveling the world. She is a great salsa dancer. And Habin, I would have asked for a dance, except that I have two left feet. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Habin Girma. Thank you. So Habin, uh, I know this is your first time in India, and uh, I'm sure uh, we'd all love to hear how the experience has been for you so far. The food here is amazing. I love Indian food, so I'm having an amazing time here. Thank you. And uh, about your salsa dancing, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not able to get over that. Is there any chance that we might ever get to watch you perform maybe in India or in Bangalore? In fact, you will be able to see me dance. And I also want to let you know that part of dancing is being respectful and kind to the people you are dancing with. So if I'm dancing with someone with two left feet, it's my job to accommodate them, because everybody deserves to dance in any way they want. Fantastic. I, I suddenly feel a lot more eligible to dance with uh, Habin. Thank you for uh, speaking with me, and uh, I'll now let you uh, address the rest of the gathering. Thank you so much, Gopi. Good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. My name is Haven, and the name Haven comes from Eritrea, a small African country. When my grandmother tried to take my older brother to school, they told her deaf-blind children can't go to school. She took him to the school for the blind, and they said, sorry, he's deaf. We can't teach deaf kids. Then she took him to the school for the deaf, and they said, sorry, he's blind. We don't teach blind kids. When my family moved to the United States, and I was born also deaf-blind, they were amazed to find communities that value diversity and inclusion. The teacher said, we don't have all the answers, but let's try. Let's find solutions. Let's make it happen. And that's how it should be. In 2010, I entered Harvard Law School as their first deafblind student. Harvard didn't know exactly how a deafblind student would succeed. They told me, we've never had a deafblind student before. And I told them, I've never been to Harvard Law School before. Remember, Helen Keller was an amazing, brilliant, smart, deaf-blind woman. Harvard would not admit her. Back then, 
Harvard said only men could get an education here. Helen's disability didn't hold her back. Her gender didn't hold her back. It was the community at Harvard that chose exclusion. Over time, the community has changed. Harvard eventually made the smart decision to open its doors to women, people of color, and people with disabilities. My grandmother back in Eritrea, for her, my success at Harvard seemed superhuman, inspirational. And I told her, it's not me, it's Harvard that changed. The community decided, the community decided that inclusion is important and all people have value. And all of us are part of communities and we all have the choice to practice inclusion and value difference. So in my talk today, I'm here to encourage everyone to continue to value inclusion and spread this message to all your different communities. It's a choice we face, and we need to continue to share this message with everyone else. I have some show stories to share. I want to share a photo that symbolizes inclusion. In this photo, President Obama is standing at a table, and he's typing on a Bluetooth keyboard. I'm also standing at the table, and I'm reading on a digital braille display. President Obama usually communicates by voice. He made the choice to accommodate me and my disability and to type rather than voicing. There are unfortunately a lot of people who don't make this choice, who say, oh, that's different. I don't want to do something that's different. That's strange. But then there are those people who say, maybe I don't know all the answers, but let's try. Let's make this work, because difference teaches us all. So President Obama in this photo is a symbol of difference and the value of inclusion. I also want to share something else. We have a video that shows sign language. Deaf communities all over the world have developed sign languages, a language created by deaf people for deaf people. In the video, we have someone who is signing tactile sign language, which is a combination sighted deaf individuals use with deaf-blind individuals. When someone signs, they hold their hand over the signer's hand. So because I'm blind, I can't see what someone is signing. So I put my hand over their hand to feel their signing. That allows me to understand what's going on. And it's a choice that communities make to practice inclusion to ensure that there's communication Another form of communication is dance. Communities all over the world have developed languages that use their bodies to communicate signals. Some signals in salsa dancing are visual, and the people I dance with make a choice to change those signals from visual to tactile signals so that I could feel the signals. And when I dance, I can't hear the music. I can't see what other dancers are doing. But through physical communication, I'm able to feel the beeps and the signals of expressing joy and the celebration of dance within a community. People with disabilities find ways to connect with their communities. Some deaf dancers who can see watch the other dancers, and they use their eyes to follow the dance. Some blind dancers use their ears and listen to the music, and that's how they engage with the music and dance. And as a deaf-blind person, I found solutions based on tactile communication, 
And I found a community that values that and also uses tactile communication. The next slide I want to show has a jungle gym. And a jungle gym symbolizes all the different options we have in forming an inclusive community. The jungle gym is a pyramid-shaped, rope-based structure in Golden Gate Park. It's about 15 feet high. And what I love about jungle gyms is that there are multiple ways to access it. There isn't a right or wrong path. There are many different paths. You can climb by sight, looking at the ropes. You can climb by sound, listening to descriptions by someone on the ground. If you have a mobility disability, you can build an assistive climbing device. It's up to us as people with disabilities to be innovative and find solutions. And it's up to communities to value inclusion and welcome us. Disability is an asset. As a person with a disability, all my life I've had to look for solutions, whether it's how to dance or how to study law. And through this process, I've developed strong analytical and problem-solving skills, which is a huge asset for any organization I work with. Many people with disabilities similarly develop strong problem-solving and analytical skills. This is an asset. Disability drives innovation. Many of the technologies we have today have been inspired by disability. I'll give you two stories. Email. One of the fathers of the internet, Vincent Cerf, is deaf. His wife is deaf. And they wanted a way to communicate long distance. Back then, we don't have, we did, they didn't have all the technological solutions that we have now. And the telephone is not accessible when you're deaf. They discovered that by sending digital messages back and forth, electronic mail, they could communicate long distance. And Mr. Surf helped develop one of the earliest email protocols. Now everybody, many different people around the world use email. And it's inspired by disability. Back in 1808, there were two individuals, two friends, one blind, one sighted. And they wanted to send letters back and forth. Letters are usually written by sight. Someone looking down on paper and writing by sight. They wanted to find a solution to produce print and write letters without requiring sight. Some blind people back then would just dictate their letters and have someone else write it down for them. They couldn't do that in this case. These letters had to stay secret. They were love letters. So they eventually helped develop a device, one of the earliest working typewriters, to be able to produce print without sight. When you're, when you're typing, you're using your hands and it's a way to produce print without using sight. Around the world, many people use keyboards. And some of the fastest letter writers are touch typists. This is another example of technology inspired by disability. It's an asset. And this is a story that we need to share with communities and companies all over the world. Not only will disability drive innovation, but disability contributes by having people bring in new ideas. And in order to have that happen, we need our software, applications, websites to be accessible to people with disabilities so they could join the workforces or take the educational tools that would allow them to later join the workforces and be parts of our communities. One tool used by the disability community is called screen readers. And I'm going to share a short video that demonstrates how screen readers work. 
little rail. The screen reader on the iPhone is called VoiceOver. VoiceOver also works on the Mac, iPad, and the Apple Watch. So when I'm using my phone, I use VoiceOver. VoiceOver can speak out loud and send information to the digital rail display. News. Checking for new news. National Geographic, unread. World's largest rodents on lamb from Toronto Zoo. I'm panning right on the rail display using the advanced forward button. If I wanted to instead use hand gestures on the iPhone, I could flick right with one finger. To open an item, I can double tap anywhere on the screen. Text size, caption, title, we title, world's large title. After escaping from the High Park Zoo in Canada, two capybaras have eluded capture for by Jason Biddle. Published June 9, most people do their best to avoid rodents of unusual size. But after a pair of capybaras escaped from Toronto's High Park Zoo on May 12, alert, Gordon. Hi, I'm at the door sushi, pot of food, fish cake with swirl design. <laughs> My friend's at the door, so I'm just going to let him know. Close. Button. Reply. Button. Messages notification. Hang. In. There. I'm. Almost. Done. With. This. Demo. Send. Button. VoiceOver has allowed me to access more information, news, mail, and messages. And it's also a way for me to know when friends are at the door. Thanks for watching. Bye. So accessibility features include screen readers. And screen readers include voiceover, but also includes TalkBack, JAWS, Window Eyes, which are screen readers used on other platforms. So we need applications and websites to be designed with accessibility in mind. Screen reader compatibility is one form of accessibility. There's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, Apple and Android mobile accessibility guidelines. And these are tools publicly available to anyone who wants to ensure their websites and applications are accessible to people with disabilities. Another accessibility feature is captions. Captions produce print on screen so that deaf individuals can follow the audio on videos. So ensuring that videos have captions will help ensure access for more people, including the deaf community. It's also important to have compatibility with assistive devices, such as braille displays like the one I use, or switch control. Switch control benefits individuals with a limited mobility. These are some of the basic accessibility features that are in existence. Keep innovating. Keep building new ways to connect to people and share information. There are one billion people with disabilities all over the world. Reaching a, a group of this scale creates value for everyone. It's a significant market. And reaching this market helps increase revenue for any company. So these are the accessibility features. There are a few things you need to keep in mind to help ensure accessibility. Planning for accessibility from the start, which is our next slide. Think about accessibility from the very beginning. It's harder to have accessibility afterwards, after you've already built the product. So it's easier to plan for it from the start. Engage with the disability community. We're the best experts. We know what works and what doesn't work. Engage with us. Engage with engineers with disabilities, testers and designers with disabilities. There are many organizations throughout India and around the world to help give feedback on ensuring accessibility. Lastly, educate your communities. Let your organizations know that disability is a value. 
It adds value. It drives innovation. So prioritize it in your company as you build your products and design future products. Next slide. If you have questions, my contact information is up there. And I'm going to be here throughout the conference tonight and tomorrow. So come over and ask me questions if you'd like to know anything. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.